This is a case where the psychic actually got it right. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Nancy and John Bosco. Viewer discretion is advised. It was a blistering August 19, 1993 day in Big Fork, Montana. Local police were called and asked to do a welfare check on the Bosco residence because a neighbor noticed that their windows had been opened. The neighbor had gone to knock on the doors. They got no response. They saw that basically the vehicles that belonged to the homeowners were still there. So it was very strange that they weren't getting any response to the knocking on the door. So police arrive and when they do so, they notice that there is a lot of fly activity kind of in an upper window of the home. And after they attempt to knock and get someone's attention from inside the home, at that point, they have enough probable cause to enter. And so they gain entry to the house. And immediately there is the just absolutely horrid smell of death. He walks up the stairs and finds his way into the master bedroom of this home where he sees an absolutely brutal scene. There were two bodies lying in the bed. There was blood spatter on the wall. The bodies were clearly very decomposed. The room smelled horrifically. There were thousands of flies in this room and the bodies were covered in maggots and fly larvae. It was grotesque. They would soon be able to identify the victims as Nancy and John Bosco. They had only been living in Big Fork, Montana for about six months. They had just purchased this home. What was immediately strange to police and the coroner on their arrival was that one of the bodies, John, his body appeared to be more decomposed than Nancy's body. John's body was, his skin was essentially blackened. That's how badly decomposed he was. But Nancy's body wasn't near that level. And so what they just sort of initially came to this conclusion of, just based on their first look, was did Nancy shoot and kill John, wait some time, and then shoot and kill herself? Well, that theory was sounded nice at first, but they knew within moments that that was not the case because there was no gun at the scene. There was no gun in Nancy's hand, no gun near the bed, under the bed, on the bed, under the bodies, nowhere to be found. And obviously that's just not possible. They found a black case next to the bed. It looked like a gun case. They opened it. They noticed that the gun that was supposed to be in there was missing. They would later find out that this was a gun that John owned legally, and this was a 357 caliber gun. So they thought, okay, it was the stolen gun that was used to kill John and Nancy. But then the coroner would say, nope, that was not the case because both victims were shot with a nine millimeter. They actually found nine millimeter bullets embedded in one of the walls. So their 357 was stolen, but it was not the murder weapon. No murder weapon was found at the scene. They found that in the basement, there was an open low level window that someone had able was able to open and enter the home. So they believe that's how the killer entered. They also found that the phone line had been cut and the power had been shut off to the entire house. So this was someone who went into the home with the intent of doing harm to whoever was in there. And they did not want whoever was in the house to be calling anyone. The rest of the house, however, looked in really normal condition. Nothing was out of place, nothing was stolen, there was no signs or indications of a fight or a struggle taking place, no drawers or cabinets open, everything else in the house was, it was perfect. So this was clearly someone who came into that home with the intent of murdering the couple and then leaving, and that was their whole plan. Okay, so why? What was the motive? I'm not really sure they would ever truly find that out. The coroner would determine that both Nancy and John had been dead about a week or so, and both of their times of death were pretty close to one another. But that was strange to hear, police to hear, because how come Nancy's body looked less decomposed than John's? That was just something super strange. Well, the coroner explained that because the way Nancy's body was found, she was completely covered up with blankets and a pillow 
over the upper half of her body. And that would slow, because her open wounds weren't visible, that would slow decomposition a little bit, and it would make for maggots and flies to get to her, it would take longer for that to happen. So that's why she was decomposed less. They also determined that John never woke up. He was shot and killed while asleep in bed. There was a very clean and through and through gunshot wound to the side of his head. Nancy, however, they believed she woke up from the sound of the gunshot because next to her side of the bed, they found broken little pieces of glass. Nancy had to wear glasses from time to time and she never wore her glasses to bed. They believe that once the gunshot went off, that Nancy kind of woke up, got her glasses to put them on just to see what just happened, what that noise was. And then she turned around and saw her attacker. And then because the phone was off the hook, they think she turned back around to grab the phone to call 911. And then the killer shot her in the back. Who were John and Nancy Bosco? John was born on April 17th, 1952. And he was born in Syracuse, New York. He was considered a, a very good-natured guy. He was well-liked. He was a very chatty and talkative person. But his family would say all that chattiness and, and his talkative kind of normal behavior would all go away if he was outside exploring, hiking, or just in nature because he was one who really loved to be one with nature. He loved being outdoors and he loved just taking in the peace and the quiet of it. He was hardworking. He was someone who did a lot of woodworking and he made his own stuff. And he was really good with his hands. He could also be known as someone with a hot temper. He had kind of sometimes a, uh, a rough personality, especially if someone wronged him. But he, he typically meant well. Eventually, he would father two children, and that was when he was living in Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado. Quite some time before this case happened, he had separated from his ex, and there was kind of a, a back and forth and really kind of tumultuous custody battle that would happen with his two kids. He would meet Nancy Renee Peterson in Colorado. Nancy, who was born on March 6, 1951, she was born in South Dakota, but again, at this time living in Colorado, she was a saleswoman and I guess she would make cold calls to people and she would go to their homes to, I'm not sure what products she sold, but she would sell products that way. And she just so happened to do a cold call to John Bosco and he said, yeah, sure, come over, sell me what you got. They met and they hit it off like immediately. And it was like a, a match made in heaven. Nancy was a very beautiful young woman. She had dreams of one day becoming a model and her looks were certainly going to potentially get her there. She was a fun-loving and very outgoing woman. Uh, she also had a very silly personality. She also loved being outdoors. She loved to explore and hike and camp, and, and that's kind of a lot of the things that Nancy and John, they just got along so quickly because they had so much in common. Everyone said that they had this like instant chemistry and that they were just destined to be with one another. And shortly after they became a couple, they would get married. Within about two years of their marriage, they actually moved to Big Fork, Montana. They purchased a home from a man named Joe Clark. Joe Clark used to own this home, but I guess because of some fire that happened at one of his businesses or something like that, he had to sell this house and then he and his family moved somewhere else in Big Fork. And it was the perfect place for John and Nancy. John and Nancy actually planned to operate a, a woodworking business out of the home. John was going to craft the products and they were going to have a portion of the house be like a little shop. They'd only lived there for six months. How could you have possibly gotten in with some kind of wrong crowd? Or how could they have possibly angered someone in that short amount of time that would warrant someone coming in and shooting both of them dead in their home. Well, that's what police struggled with from the get-go. But they did uncover pretty quickly that John had been in a very heated custody battle with his two kids and his ex. At one point, his ex was granted full custody, but then it switched to him getting full custody, and then it kind of went back and forth. And then at one point, John takes the kids from Boulder, Colorado, and he moves them to Montana and enrolls them in school, which enrages his ex, who then files uh, court documents and custody documents and then she goes to montana she takes the kids directly out of school brings them back to boulder colorado the kids both of them absolutely idolized john i mean they adored him they loved him to pieces and he loved them more than anything I mean, even more than his wife like he absolutely 
just those kids meant everything to him. He was a great dad. He was a really, really wonderful father. And so what they found out, the investigators, is that John and Nancy, because of this custody issue, they had actually planned a trip to drive to Boulder, Colorado to deal with this custody battle. And the plan was they were going to be leaving the day after the murder took place. So they thought to themselves, well, was this a motive? Was someone, maybe someone connected to the ex? They, did they go out to Montana to kill both John and Nancy to prevent this custody thing from happening and the ex getting full custody forever? Well, they had to, you know, they had to look into that. As police are looking into that, they're also looking into the fact that there are rumors around town that Nancy, she was really concerned about some local high school kids in the area she said that she was being spied on by these kids. They were kind of like harassing her as they drove by. They would spy on her as she was sunbathing on her deck. But initially police didn't really have any evidence to connect any of those kids to what happened to them. They just at that time couldn't find anything. Then they interview John's mom. John's mom tells them that John had been in a very, very, very recent legal battle, potential legal battle with the man who sold him the home, Joe Clark. John found out about certain zoning laws and that this house that was sold was apparently not allowed to operate a commercial business out of it because of these zoning laws. John says that Joe Clark never disclosed that information to him. Joe Clark says, he, I told him everything. I was very upfront with all of it. But this is really irritating to John because he's like, I can't operate this business. This is why we moved here. This is gonna be my bread and butter. This is our dream. Now we can't do it. And John was not someone who would back down from things like this. And this is where his hot-headedness got in the way at times. He had approached Joe Clark and threatened to sue him with a civil lawsuit. And he kept kind of yelling at him and accusing him of like, you did this on purpose, you lied to me. And Joe Clark's like, no, I didn't. Police can see this as being a motive for Joe Clark to commit these murders because of this potential civil lawsuit against him. And then police are looking into everyone and anyone they can in Nancy's life, in John's life, just to see if anyone else was upset with them or anything like that. They learned that John had become very paranoid. Uh, he thought that the legal system in Colorado was out to get him. He said that he knew things about the Colorado legal system that he could expose their corruption. And this was all due in part to all of this back and forth with the custody with the kids. He even at one point told someone that he thinks that these people in Colorado will kill him because to prevent him from revealing what he knows. But in the end, they all they found out was that these paranoid thoughts were just paranoid thoughts. There was no truth behind the accusations he was saying. John's ex painted him in a very negative light, said he was a jerk. But detectives learned that she was uh, really, she was no better. Uh, the kids actually didn't like being with her. The kids wanted to be with John and they really did not want to be with her in Colorado. But she was insistent that she had them. So they continue to dig deep into this custody thing because this could be a very solid motive for someone to kill them. And they investigate, investigate, investigate. They question as many people. They get documents. They read documents. They pull out all the evidence they can. Nothing, not one single thing links that situation to the murders. There's like, you know, they can confirm that the ex was in Colorado at the time of the murders. She did not, there was no money, you know, going places like high amounts to pay for someone to do this. They couldn't find anything. And so they pretty much ruled that angle out. This is when we uh, meet Danian Brinkley. Danian Brinkley is a psychic slash spiritual medium. And he was brought in by John's mom because John's mom was just desperate for anything. She was desperate for answers and that police weren't getting anywhere. So maybe, who knows, maybe a psychic could help. And usually in cases like this, psychics typically aren't don't provide genuine information. Sometimes they do, but the majority of the times they don't. So he has a session with John's mom. They have this thing he calls like this connection with the heart and heart vibrations or something. I'm not really sure what he said, but he then says he can envision and he can see through the eyes of the killer. He sees everything the killer did. 
He sees him cutting the phone line. He sees him uh, entering through the window. He sees him turning off the power. He says he entered through a low window, which was a basement window. He can see the killer through his eyes walking up a long staircase. And uh, Danyan saying, I have this feeling, because I am embodying the killer here, I have this feeling that I've been in this house before, that I know this house really well. And then Danyan says in this vision, he sees a reflection of himself, i.e. the killer, in a mirror, and he sees this young kid, like maybe t late teenager, early 20s type kid. He is uh, skinny. He has dark hair. He has these like inset eyes. He sees a nine millimeter in his hand. And then he says he feels that the killer, when he kills both the couple, he sees how he shot John first. And he sees Nancy getting up and trying to put on her glasses and he sees the killer shooting her. And then he has this feeling of the killer doesn't know exactly why he did this. He doesn't know his own motivation. Then Danyan says he has one final image that the killer was going to be arrested in December. Meanwhile, in December, police get a phone call from police in Newburgh, Oregon, that they have information about a college student there who apparently has confessed to committing two murders in Big Fork, Montana. This kid is telling disturbing stories to these other kids at school about how he killed this couple. And he shows them a nine millimeter handgun. He says, this is the gun that I used to do it. This kid is only known, I guess, around school as his name is Shadow. So Montana police, desperate for anything, they go out to Oregon and they see what we can do about this. And they learn Shadow's full name. His name is Joseph Shadow Clark. Does that name sound familiar to you, Clark? That's because Shadow Clark is the son of Joe Clark, the guy who was having a legal, potential legal dispute with John. They also find out that Shadow Clark is one of the kids that Nancy had accused of spying on her. They bring in Shadow for questioning, and initially he denies any of it. He says, oh, I'm just telling stories. That's all they were, stories. But they question him for a couple more hours, and he finally begins to crack. He starts going from, well, these were dreams and nightmares to this is what I did. That these nightmares had directed him to do what he did. And then he confesses he was the one to kill John and Nancy Bosco. Here's the crazy thing. He describes the murder and it is identical precisely to the to the every tiny movement of what Daniel Brinkley described in his vision. It was perfect. It was exactly how he said it happened. And what's more is the the description he said of the killer in the mirror is exactly looked like. And when he said he had these feelings of, I've been in this house before as the killer, I, I, I'm very familiar with this house. Well, uh, Shadow Clark, the home that John and Nancy lived in, that he committed these murders in, it was his childhood home that he grew up in. It was uncanny how accurate Daniel was. Not all of this information was released in the newspapers and to the public. So there's a lot of information that Daniel described that later Shadow would describe that nobody could have possibly known. And so it appears that a psychic in this particular case was not just right, but was freaking dead on. But what was the motive? I mean, was it the legal dispute? Was it, was it that? Did his dad make him do it? No, they found no evidence of that. They ultimately believe that Nancy, was, he was so infatuated with Nancy that his goal was to go there and maybe sexually assault her or whatever the case may be, but instead he kind of panicked and just shot John. And when Nancy woke up, he shot her. And then they think that he likely did some sort of sexual act on her after she was dead, but they don't have proof of that. But they believe that it was his obsession with Nancy as to what led him to do this. Truly though, they don't actually know the, the full motive because he says he claims he has no idea why he did it. He says he just, just doesn't know. So they never really established for sure with evidence an actual motive. Guess when he was arrested in December of 1993, exactly like Daniel said would happen. What are the odds? They tell him, listen, we're going for the death penalty on this one because this was just was horrific. He then decides to plead guilty instead to avoid the death penalty. And he is initially sentenced to 220 years in prison. 
Uh, but then I guess on some kind of appeal, his uh, sentence is reduced to 150 years. Good luck uh, surviving that one. However, he can get paroled when he is 60 years old. So he has got quite some time left uh, before that happens. He is still uh, rotting away in a prison cell. And hopefully this is the type of person that never, ever, ever gets out. One could hope. One could, one could really hope that that does not happen. And by the way, they actually found the stolen 357 Magnum in the Clark home that Shadow was living in at the time of the murders. And because he had just, this was just before he went to college, but they found that gun in the bedroom that Shadow Clark lived in. It was hidden, but they found it. So that just gave further proof that he was in the house that night. He was the one who committed the murders. It was 100% him. So, so a psychic got it right. They knew who, he described everything perfect. I mean, did it? Did he actually help solve the crime? No, uh, because ultimately it was police in Oregon who kind of got Shadow to the forefront of this, but it doesn't change the fact that that guy, I mean, he was accurate as hell. I, I don't normally believe in these types of things when it comes to this, but it's hard to dispute this one. Uh, it's just, it's it's difficult. I can't, I can't, I can't really, uh, I don't know. It's just so weird. And so thankfully it only took a handful of months or so. We weren't, they weren't waiting years and years and years for the answers on this one. They finally, you know, they got the answers within a six month period. And so in the end, Nancy and John Bosco, they got the justice they both rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe to the channel if you like true crime. I tell stories basically every day at this point. Sometimes I might take a break. I don't know. You'll find out, I guess. Uh, so yeah, so please subscribe, give the video a like, and follow me over on TikTok. I have two different pages that I tell true crime stories on in short form. The links to those are in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links will also pop up here at some point in the beginning and at the end of the video. So check it out if you want. Also in the link tree below you'll find my merch store we ship all over the entire world uh, we have like t-shirts and hoodies so check it out if you like and then lastly if there's a case you want me to cover just send me a really quick email which is the name of the person where it happened and when it happened i'll add it to my list my email is listed below by the way i'll add it to the list the list has got over 6200 names on it it may be a while before i get to your case i pick my cases at random so it'll happen eventually i just can't tell you when but Thanks for tuning in, and we shall see you for the next one. So until then, ta-ta for now. True crime, a rooney dooney dingleberry dongles. Mm-hmm. Dingleberries. Yum.